Take your Bibles, if you would, please open it up. Numbers chapter 13. It's where we're going to start. It's, there was a lot of thought that I had, a lot of time that I had to put into this and wasn't sure some of the verses where to stick them, so I just stuck them somewhere. And I had mentioned uh, a while back about strongholds and what all that means and how the devil will build strongholds in your life. And he uses them to gain advantage over you. He uses them to vex you. It, it is an area of your life that the devil is in and he's not leaving anytime soon. It, you, you haven't run him out. He has literally built an effective stronghold in your life. Or it could be in your family. There could be, there could be a, a family member that the devil has his agents in working as a stronghold to warfare against your family. Your family may be trying to serve God. There may be a family member that the devil's got his clutches in and he belongs to Satan. You may realize it. You may not realize it. But he's there to destroy you. He's there to destroy your family. He's going to use from that position. He's going to launch his attack into your family and try to destroy you. He will create strongholds in a church. He will use individual people or possibly a group of people who have decided that they are of like mind and usually that like mind is contrary to what the pastor and what the church believes but the devil loves to sow seeds of confusion and discord in a church and then get them busted up mad at one another because this group saying well no the Holy Ghost is like this and this is what the Bible says and you're all wrong but the pastor and the church have been built on a maybe a different ideology, a different doctrine. And they're saying, this is what we have believed for years. And you can't just come in and change it. And they will try to draw and attract as many proselytes over to their cause as they can. And they will not leave until they have pulled about as many people as they can pull over to their side. And then when they leave, they're going to take them with you. And you've lost about half your church. I've seen that happen. Now in Numbers chapter 13, we get introduced to a stronghold. And I want you to look at what he said in Numbers 13 verse 17. And Moses sent them out to spy the land of Canaan. This is when Moses sent the, the 12 spies into Canaan land to see what kind of land it was. And he said unto them, get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain. And see the land and what it is. And the people that dwell therein. Whether they be strong or weak. Are these really giants that we had heard about? Or are they just little pipsqueaks? Are they few? Or are they many? And what the land is that they dwell in. Whether it be good or bad. And what cities they be that dwell in. And then he said, whether they dwell in tents. Or in strongholds. Now Moses is a warrior judge leader. He's fought several battles. He understands a little bit about how it works and how it goes. And he knows that if these giants who are living in the land of Canaan have built themselves strongholds. Then yes, it is going to be quite a task to get them out of that city or to destroy them when they attack those cities. Now if they all live in tents... All you got to do is light arrows on fire and shoot them at the tents. And there goes that. That was pretty easy. But if they have built them strongholds, the chances of you being able to get them out of there are very slim. And they're going downhill fast. So that's about the first place in the Bible that you find that phrase strongholds. Now, 2 Corinthians 10, turn there in your Bible. This is more of a a study than it is a message. And I, 
What I'd like for you to do is, if you don't take notes, I'd like for you to take notes, because I think you need some of this. I had an encounter early Saturday morning, of which I will tell you about in a little bit. I, I won't tell you all of it. Um, it was pretty bad. I can say, you know, I woke up some days, told my wife, man, I had a bad dream. What was it about? I'm not talking about it. But this particular dream, my wife actually heard me going through it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war after the flesh. That's actually part of the Watchman broadcast that's coming out today. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? So what is God, what is God telling you in this verse already, that already exists in your life? That the devil has built strongholds in your life. He has built in you an area of strength that you are powerless against it. And when he decides to go to warfare, when he decides to go to work, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Because he has built himself a defensive area that will not easily be taken down. Anybody who's ever fought a war, doesn't matter if it's a 21st century war, 20th century war, 19th or 18th or 17th or 16th century war, these people have had to learn about building strongholds. Places that they need to defend in case the enemy shows up, they have a strong defensive posture to thwart any enemy that may want to come and invade. Ronald Reagan was probably one of the best presidents minded toward this in my lifetime at least. He knew that in doubling the amount of nuclear weapons and shields that we had as this nation against the Soviet Empire, against the Chinese, against the North Koreans, against anybody who wanted to do us harm. He knew that in doubling or tripling the amount of nuclear warheads that we had, that that would fix it so that if Russia decided to start and incite a war against us, a nuclear war, it had already set up the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Once Russia sent a missile our way, we were going to send a thousand to Russia. Amen. Amen. And Russia would have to retaliate by sending as much as they had over our way. And all of a sudden, boom, both nations are destroyed. So what's the purpose of it? Who won? There is no winner in the nuclear war. There just isn't one. So he said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Notice that he said right after that, casting down the imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into a, uh, captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having it a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Let's pray and then I'm going to share some things with you. Father, I ask for your help to preach this message. Father, I, I'm aware of the time already. And Lord, I don't mean to drag it out, but this is very important. It's very important. It, this, is vital. this is stuff, Father, that if some people don't get a hold of, Lord, it'll be by your grace if they make it. It is things that you've taught me, Father, out of necessity. That after a while, I got sick and tired of the strongholds. 
I, I got, I, I just did, I got tired of them. I didn't want them around anymore. And Lord, in many ways, Father, you've delivered me from many of them. And I am, I'm beyond thankful for what you've done for me. So, Father, bless your word. Help me, Father, to teach it in a right and proper way. Give, it, give understanding to your people and light unto them. Help fathers and mothers understand that there could be strongholds that are trying to destroy their marriage. Help these same people, Father, understand that there could be strongholds in their family that are trying to destroy their family. There could be strongholds in one of their children. There could be strongholds, Lord, in another family member who is trying to inject themselves into that family's life. Father, that there could be in this very church someone, Lord, that the devil has built a massive stronghold in. They are here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to help Satan destroy this church. Now, I don't know that, that it is anybody right now, Father, but I'm fully conscious, I'm fully aware that there's always the possibility that that'll, the devil will try that again. So, Father, give us wisdom, give us knowledge and an understanding of how things work. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, I'm going to say something to you that I don't, I've, I, I've not preached about, I don't think at all, really, in the years that I've been preaching. That is in the area of dreams and imaginations, imaginings, and things like that. I had, I've had in the past dreams that I have felt that they may hold some sort of uh, purpose from God, a plan from God, one in particular that I do really believe that God uh, is doing now and has been doing for a long while in my life. I remember the dream. Now, in the book of Joel, when he said that the, he's going to pour out a spirit upon flesh. And he said, your old men shall dream dreams and young men shall see visions. I have to believe the Bible. And I believe that. Now, however, you don't hear me preach on them. You don't hear me tell them. Because the Bible says... And, and even though the Bible is saying that God will give people dreams, God will give people visions and so on. The Bible also says, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. And the problem with a dream is, how can you prove to somebody that you actually dreamed it? Because they cannot ever see the operation of your mind, especially while you're asleep. And how many people do you think have stood up in a church service where they buy into that stuff and said, Oh, you sh oh the Lord gave me a dream last night. Woo! Oh, the Lord gave the Holy Spirit come on me and fell on me. And I got a dream and it's a prophecy for this church. But actually the guy is making it up. And he's using that as a spiritual cover because he was with a mistress the night before. And he don't want anybody to know that. So he's using that for a spiritual cover. I see this stuff all the time. You cannot ever know whether someone actually had a dream, even if they said, I promise you I had it. That's the first sign that they, they probably didn't have it. I've had what I believe to be dreams that I thought were of a prophetic nature. Now, you've never heard me tell them. And you probably never will. Because I don't trust them. Now, if they happen, I will go, I dreamed that. 
But I'm one of these, if you want to know what God's going to do, don't come asking me what dream I had. Ask God what dream he put in the Bible to reveal what he's going to do. Because after all, do we not trust the book of Romans? Does not everybody here trust the, the book of Romans? Do you trust the book of Romans? Say amen. Do you trust the book of Ezekiel? Say amen. Do you trust Joel, the prophet? Do you, do you trust Daniel? Do you trust that Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar the right interpretation of all his dreams? you trust Joseph? That Joseph told Pharaoh, the king, the right interpretation of his dreams? See, that's the difference. That's the Bible. Whereas somebody like me telling you this is what happened, this is what happened, you have no idea whether that really happened in my mind or not, that I actually saw that in my mind or not. This dream in particular, and let me explain to you, I've tried to do this over time, the workings of the human mind. And I may not get as far as I wanted to today in this message, but let me tell you how this mind works. You have two halves of your brain. This left side of your brain controls all the logic, factual information, decision making that you have to make of things based on the truth. If I ask you a question and I'm wanting a truthful answer out of you, it is the left brain that is going to reveal, that's going to give me the answer because the left brain stores facts, knowledge, experience, remembrances of how things were if i ask you uh name your name how many cousins do you have you could say i've got seven cousins L list me their names your mind will have to go into a place in the brain where it's stored the names of all these seven cousins you have and you're probably going to go well the name of one of them was this and you and you're trying to go through the list and you're reading information like a computer does that's telling the truth. That's giving factual information. The right side of the brain deals with imaginations. That's the part that we have to worry about. Imaginations is the part of our brain that makes up lies and tells stories that are not true. And or it is where if temptation is going to be presented to you by the devil, he will more than likely, in fact, I believe it 100%, he has access to the imaginative part of your brain, the right brain. He has access to that with, and he does not need permission from you or God to get it. And let me tell you why I said that. When the devil came down in Genesis chapter 3 to try to get mankind to fall and disobey God, who did he go to? Adam? No, because he knew that Adam had heard every word of God and knew the commandment of God concerning the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the devil knew that if he said, Adam, I don't believe God really said that you couldn't eat for that tree. Adam would say, devil, you're a liar. I heard God's own voice. Well, you, what are you telling me what God said to me? You weren't there. I was. And Adam and say, get out of the way from me. But he didn't go to Adam. He went to Eve. The weaker vessel. Because the right side of your brain is the submissive weaker vessel of your brain. And he goes and he gets Eve to start imagining what it would be like to eat that fruit. What it would be like to taste that fruit. What it would be like to fill her belly with that fruit. What it would be like to receive this wisdom and knowledge that would elevate her to the position of a God. That's what she's going through. And she's seeing that by imagining it in this part of her mind. Does that make sense to everybody? When children are going to lie, they always lie from over here. Because they have to draw up a story first. And that's done in the imaginations. And then, and you can always tell, just watch their eyes. They'll be looking down. They'll be looking over here. And you can tell they're making a movie. 
of what they want you to believe. Okay? Cops know this. Cops are trained in this. Talk to somebody in their car. Is there any drugs in the car? And if the guy says, sir, there's no drugs in this car at all, I guarantee you that. I mean, that was a very quick, fast-forward answer. The guy was drawing on facts. He knows there's no drugs in the car. A guy that has to lie about it, it takes him a couple seconds to write the lie out first so he can try to get away with it. He's using imaginations. Now, I've told you all that to tell you this. While I do believe that I think it's possible that God can give us dreams, I don't know quite what they're for yet. Maybe God has us knowing some of them. Some of the dreams, you dream every night, you just don't remember them. But some of them, some of the dreams you've had, you remember to this day. Every detail. And I believe the devil has nearly unlimited access to the right side of my mind, the imaginations. If he tempts me, he's going to use my imagination to tempt me. If he's going to tempt me to lust, he'll use my imagination for me to draw out a picture of how this would be. If he's going to tempt me to lie, he's going to help me draw the picture of how I can get by with this. And it's all done over here. And I believe he's got access to that part. Saturday morning, I, I woke up. And after Lisa and I had been up for a while, I asked her, I said, did you hear me talking in my sleep early this morning? And she said, yeah. What was that about? And I said, it was bad. It was a very, very bad dream. I asked her, what did you hear me say? And she said, who are you? Is what she heard me say. I was saying that out loud. You know how dreams are? They're, they're weird. They're a conglomeration of stories and encounters that when you put them all together, they just don't add up for some reason. And part of this was, I was with a group of preachers that I know, good men. And we were, I don't know what the deal was, there were some churches that were trying to hold revivals, and they were trying to entice us into their revivals, but we knew these were false churches. And at some point, Bullets start whizzing past my head. It dawns on me, somebody's shooting at me. And Brother John Uter was in the dream. And I said, John, I got people shooting at me. I don't know what, I don't know what to do, where to go. The next part of the dream. Uh, apparently I've been preaching somewhere with these guys. And I laid in our camper at night at a campsite by myself. And that's hardly ever done. I travel with my wife for a reason. Multiple reasons. But we stay together. And God's blessed us staying together all these years. But in this dream, she's not there. And I'm laying, it's dark, I'm laying there asleep. I'm I'm actually asleep in my dream. And a devil climbs on me. And it, it's very just, it's sort of weird to describe what I was experiencing. Because I could feel the body of this devil. It had a sort of a human body. But I could feel it mingled with darkness. It literally had darkness mingled in its body. And this devil was trying to envelop me and hold me. 
And that's when I said, Who are you? Because why, why is this thing in my camper? And then I started saying, Get off me! Get off me! Because we were wrestling. And then the Lord put it in my spirit to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get off of me. And not too long after that, I woke up. And I went, thank God that was a dream. And it was still way early in the morning. So I went right back to sleep. And as soon as I did, boom, there it is again. And we wrestled some more. And I called out the name of Jesus. Had a swollen tongue. So it wasn't all coming out right. Now let me say this. I hear a lot of people talk about. They've seen aliens. They've seen ghosts. They've seen this. They've seen that. And they say, all you got to do is say the name of Jesus and they'll leave. I don't believe that. I don't believe that everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in the kingdom of heaven. I think devils can tell the difference between somebody who just uses Jesus' name and someone who actually has Jesus' name in them. Many shall say unto me, Lord, have we not cast out devils in thy name? And he said, depart from me, for I never knew you. Many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, in that day. I never knew who you were. So that was, and I've not given you all the details. And they'll go to the grave with me. Because it was bad. It was probably the worst, probably the worst spiritual attack that I've ever had in my life. Because I woke up and that day, I was very sullen, very sullen mood. And it was bothering me. But I thought, you know, why don't I use that to try to help somebody that maybe the devil has a stronghold in their life and they're tired of it. So now, take a look up on the screen. Remember, where'd Gary go? Gary is wanting to sing this song, Higher Ground. Let me explain what strongholds are. Strongholds are fortifications. In a stronghold, there will be usually a high tower. What's a high tower good for? The higher you can see, the farther you can see. Amen? Which is what made us think about, hey, I wonder if we could put cameras in space to look at what the Russians were doing. And it worked. So we've got stronghold positions up in space. I don't have any doubt that we've got a few nukes up there too. I don't doubt that at all. But they are... Places of enforcement that make it nearly impossible for any enemy to prevail against it. Now, if you have a stronghold in your life that is where you are protecting yourself and you're protecting your family and you're helping to protect this church, God bless you. Because there are some good strongholds. Does anybody know what picture this is? Anybody know what this is? Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Now, the nation of Cuba, friendly to us or unfriendly to us? They hate our guts. Russians tried to put nuclear missiles on that island as a first strike offensive to hit us as soon as possible. It was all part of the Bay of Pigs invention. It was a terrible time. 
We were afraid that we were going to nuclear war any moment during that time. So what the Cubans did real, back when the Cuba was a good country, we leased Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and that land there to put in a naval base. And the terms of the lease are that no matter what happens, the only way that Cuba can get that ground back is if we abandon that naval base. I hope that Joe Biden doesn't go stupid one day and say, I'm going to pull everybody out of Guantanamo Bay. We don't need it no more. Listen, people, we have a stronghold in Cuba's backyard and they can't do a thing about it. Amen? Now, this is exactly, I'm going to turn this around to the opposite and I want you to see it for what it is. Let's say that your, your life is Cuba. Or let's say that your family is Cuba. Let's say that this church is Cuba. And our sworn enemies have a position of a stronghold inside our church that we can't get rid of them. And they will always have an effect on our services, our beliefs, how we fellowship, how we get along. Do you think, that, listen, I'm telling you, some people in this church swear there's a ghost, a devil, a spirit in this church. I don't disbelieve it. I've not seen it, but I don't disbelieve it. But I do believe the devil in every church will try to establish a stronghold in that church. It may be one person. It may be a group of people that that group of people is always going to try their best to undermine the authority of the word of God in that church and the authority of the pastor in that church. They're always going to try to do that no matter what. They'll always operate behind the scenes. Or let's say in your family. Let's say that your son or your daughter now has picked up a new friend. And that new friend, their family, they practice all kinds of witchcraft. They do this. We had a family, a lady that brought her four daughters to our Christian school years ago. We took them in. Then we found out because they started telling the girls in the school that their mama practiced ritualistic witchcraft at home. And they were trying some of the stuff here at the school. And I went, get out. You know, that mama didn't like that, that I did that. But I told her, I said, I've heard that you practice witchcraft. And I know that your daughters are doing it here. We don't allow that. I don't want to see you or your daughters back in this place ever again. That's what strongholds are. Turn to Isaiah chapter 7. Let me show you how they get in. Isaiah chapter 7. This could be a breach in your life, your family, your church, or your country. Let me ask, let me ask our men. Men, does it matter to your family that you have secret sins? That they may or may not know about. You might be you might be carrying around a little bottle of liquor under your seat of your truck or your car. Or you might be carrying around a little thing of magazines under your toolbox where your wife can't find it. Or you might be texting some women online. Your wife never know it. 
You know, there's a, there's a satanic stronghold in that family. And the devil is using the husband to break into that family and destroy it. It would be the same in a church. If the devil started taking somebody in this church and filling their life with sin and the pleasures of sin and the enjoyments of sin... And then the devil would use them to spread the effects of that sin to other people in the church. What was Jezebel doing? She was teaching the people of that church to commit fornication. In Isaiah chapter 7 verse 5, Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it. And let us make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Now let me explain what the word vex is. Vex is it's like if, who in here doesn't like someone scratching fingernails on a chalkboard? That's most of you. So if I come out here and I just brought a chalkboard, which doesn't bother me, I can do that all day long, and start scratching chalkboards, how long y'all going to take that? Some of you is going to probably shoot me. To get me to stop. That's what vexation is. Lot was vexed with what he was seeing in Sodom every day. It was gnawing at him. It was pounding on his door every day. The effects of the sins of Sodom were reaching into Lot and his family. He lost his sons-in-law over it. He lost his wife over it. Because they vexed Lot so much. And then they stole his sons-in-law. They stole his wife to their side. And he lost them all as a result of it. Their whole objective is. God builds walls around us of salvation. But the devil knows how. To vex and then breach that wall so that he can get in. And what he says, let us go up against Judah and vex it. And let us make a breach therein for us. And set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. In other words, we're going to get rid of their king. We're going to put our king in their city so that we rule over them. They don't rule over themselves. That happens in churches. That happens in families. Hey, let me ask you this. Dave, some of you guys, Jeff, do you think that foreign nations have interfered in the ongoing political things in our country? They breached our nation in order to set up their power structures inside the United States of America so that every election goes their way, every trade agreement goes their way, all the money that is generated in this country is stolen and given to Chinese party, Russian oligarchs, Middle Eastern powers, Buying guns for enemies of our nation and on and on and on. And by the way, breaching the wall that we're trying to build down in Texas, all that will do is allow another portal for them to come flooding through. And that's the objective. Let them flood through, vex our nation, and turn our nation in from a republic to a socialist dictatorship. You believe that's going to happen? I do. And it worked the same way in your life, your family, your church, and your country. It would be like a beehive built up inside the wall of your house. They're there, and they're not going anywhere. And they're hard to get rid of. 
You can't just knock that nest down and expect them to go away. If you don't find the queen, they're going to be right back to building that and you'll never get rid of them. Um, man, it's 1230. I want to preach the rest of this, but I'm going to wait. Because there's a lot more here than what I thought. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this in two. And I'm going to let you go. But there's a whole story in the book of Nehemiah. About how when they came back to Jerusalem, they were trying to stop the breaches that had been put into the wall around Jerusalem. And the Bible actually shows you a conspiracy of men to make sure that wall never got finished. See, walls are salvation. And the devil always wants a clear path into your life. Because he wants total control. And I've been around long enough in churches, Sister Betty, to see it happen to one person after another, after another, after another. Let's stand to our feet.